Welcome to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm your host, Sid Evans, and today I'm talking with a mother-daughter duo who are bringing hip-hop culture to the Nashville country scene. Takitha Washington is a singer and songwriter who's worked extensively with the Wu-Tang Clan and its members, as well as rap artists like KRS-One. Prana Supreme Diggs is her daughter with Wu-Tang founder RZA, and as a result, she's been around music all her life. Several years ago, the two moved to Nashville and formed One, the duo. Now, after a series of singles, their recently released debut album, Blood Harmony, manages to capture their close family dynamic as well as their incredible talent. We'll talk about all that and how Prana convinced her mom to work with her on this week's Biscuits and Jam. Keitha and Prana of Won the Duo, welcome to Biscuits and Jam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sid. Thank so you great for having to be us. here. So I saw y'all perform just a few weeks ago for an event called Next Women of Country, and it was just this amazing night of music. What was it like being on stage with all that talent? Inspiring, really. It's always nice. I think sisterhood and girl power and all that, not to sound corny, is really important. And being on stage with all those other girls, I really, really adore them in their artistry and their songwriting. And they're just really great people. I wish I got to spend more time with them outside of the events that we get to see them at. But being on stage with everyone is always just like, oh man, we're all on this journey together, we're all on this road together. Mm -hmm. For me, it's very surreal because to Prana's point, you're talking about the cream of the crop where country artistry is concerned. And for us to have been included in such a fine group of women and for Leslie Fram to have the vision that she has for supporting women in country music and that we have the privilege and the honor to be included in that group. And then we get to share a stage with said women. It's very surreal. It's something I would not have expected to happen in my lifetime. It's something I wouldn't even have conceived. Every time I get to sit with them, I'm just like, what the heck? Like, what am I doing here? You know what I mean? Just because of so much respect. Well, it was a great night and so much talent and everybody brought such a different approach to country music, different voices, different points of view. And it's really exciting to see where it's all going. Yeah, agree. So you're a mother-daughter duo and you call yourselves One the Duo. Yeah. And first, I just want to kind of get straight with the voices, who's who. So to Keitha, when it comes to Southern food, what's your guilty pleasure? My guilty pleasure is wings, fried wings and a cast iron skillet. You know, my maternal grandmother is from Texas. My paternal grandmother is from Little Rock, Arkansas. Southern food has been a staple in my life forever. And I come from a Baptist Christian household on my paternal grandparents' side. So it was all about Sunday dinner. And my grandmother, Lillian Washington, who I'm also named after, my middle name is Lillian, my grandmother would cook everything. And she has seven children, my father, uncles, and my aunt. And so she's making meals for not just her seven children, but then all of their friends, the church folk, the grown kids, you know, everybody. And so... One of my favorite things is the chicken. (laughs) It's like, but made in a cast iron skillet. If it's not cast iron, I don't think that I want it, you know? (laughs) So that's probably my guilty pleasure because, you know, grease and fried food, not so good for us. (laughs) That's a guilty pleasure for a lot of people. Nothing wrong with that. Prana, what about you? I don't believe in guilty pleasures. I do not feel guilty about food. (laughs) But I guess as close as you could get would be Peach Cobbler. I'm a pretty well-known sweet tooth haver. It's a problem. I, I'm like, ah, oh, I haven't had any sweets today. I did a really good job. And then I remember, oh, wait, no, I had that cookie. And then I had those gummy bears. And then I had that slice of cake. And then my friend brought me a pie from the place they work at. It's bad. A real bready peach cobbler is what I want. I don't want a peach cobbler that's runny. 
My grandma, she makes the best peach cobbler. Oh, it's a staple. She's visiting soon, and now that I think about it, I'm going to ask her to make one for my birthday. Now, is this your grandmother in California, or is this one in Arkansas? She's from California, born and raised. But she makes a mean peach cobbler. Oh, yeah. Mean. (laughs) My yaya's mom was from Texas, so she got it passed down to her. Yeah. Uh, Wow, I love that. I love yaya. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Y-I-A, Y-I-A. It means grandmother in Greek and earth in Swahili. So it was like mm-hmm. a double meaning. Mm-hmm. Well, whatever y'all are eating, you're doing something right because you're both beautiful. And I hope it's okay to say that when I saw y'all on stage that night, it was hard to tell who was the mother and who was the daughter. I mean, you honestly seem more like sisters. Do y'all ever get that comment? We get it all the time. Mom used to take offense. Yes. She'd be like, you guys look like sisters. She'd be like, I'm her mom. I'm like, it's a compliment. <laughs> it's a compliment so you. Yeah, I did. Yes. I guess because she's already so bright and buoyant. And I feel buoyant as well. But I'm like, hey, hold on, y'all. Don't discredit these years I put on the planet. Like, <laughs> you feel like, like it takes away from your wisdom? Yeah, I do. I feel like it's like people think that I'm trying to be young. I'm not trying to do nothing. I just live like this. No, this is just my life. life. But the thing is, <laughs> they look at us and they see how we interact and they're like, oh, yeah, sisters or friends. And That's not like, look at this old lady. Trying old lady to trying to be here. Like, that's, yeah, like, that's not happening. Oh, my God. But that is how I think that I'm taking yeah. it. Well, I hope you're taking it as a compliment as men as one. <laughs> yes. Takitha, y'all have lived in Nashville for a while now, but I want to start out asking you a little bit about where you grew up. Tell me about your family and your hometown. I was born in Stockton, California in 1973, and I was raised in Sacramento. My parents were high school sweethearts and teen parents. My father was an All-American basketball player two years in a row, slated to go to Division I schools and the league, even back in the 70s. You know what I'm saying? Wow. My mother and my father got married when I was two. He was already in college at that point. So I was raised in Sacramento only for a brief time and in Stockton only for a brief time because my father was going to college. And he insisted that he take his wife and his daughter with him wherever he went. A lot of my story starts in California, but I think I became a nomadic type of being because of the way that I was raised and because I was raised by an athlete and an intellectual, and I am an athlete and an intellectual myself. So my story does begin in Stockton, California, and then onward to Montana. I lived in Butte for a period of my life. I was in elementary school in Spokane, Washington because that's where my parents were. And then we came back to Sacramento and that's where I was the latter part of elementary and middle school and high school was in Sacramento. Oh, wow. Okay. But you've also got these Southern connections through your grandparents. I mean, do you feel a connection to Arkansas and Texas through them? Did you kind of get to know those places? I don't feel I got to know the places as much, but because I know the people and those were the people who raised me. So my father was born in Little Rock and didn't come to California until he was in middle school. I want to say 13. He came to the Bay Area, to Daly City in San Francisco, and then a bunch of our family migrated around Richmond and the East Bay as well. So for me... When we travel and come to Texas or come to Arkansas, the root is in me because it is in my family and they brought those traditions with them when they came to California. Yeah. Traveling by train to Texas and visiting our cousins in Texas was something that we did routinely, Temple, Texas to be exact. Part of my childhood and a part of my life is actually built and bred in the Southern culture, even though Mm. I was born in California. See what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me about when Prana came into this world. What was your life like at that moment? Oh, wow. So when Prana came into existence, I was 27 years old. And prior to that, I had already been on the road for the better part of six, seven years globally. 
Riza and I, we were always very good friends. That's kind of the nature of our relationship is friendship, okay? And we started talking about what it would be like to have a child, who that human would be, and what kind of contribution we could make to society if we created a being together. It's a true story. Um, I hate to say it like this, but like science, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) It's not as romantic as people would like to think, (laughs) but it was based on true respect and love for one another, but also just our intention. Riza and I are very intentional people. Prior to Prana coming, I was on the road, I was traveling, I was recording a ton. I was still working a lot with Wu-Tang, but I had already ventured out into house music and more elements of soul, pop, rock, like everything. This was the time though, where I knew I could do this now. When she was conceived and born, I had such a vision for her that I knew that her vision was not going to be too different from my own because I'm not going to stop being Takitha. And so six months after I gave birth to Prana, I was back in the studio with her in a car seat (laughs) working with Armand Van Helden, who is a globally recognized house producer. But there she is sitting there listening to the vocals being tracked and we were working on a project called Sahara, totally outside the countryscape, but just to give you the background. I enlisted my little cousin Zanaya to come and travel with us to watch Prana so that I could keep working because there wasn't even an option in my mind that I would stop working because of the baby. (laughs) No, she's just a part of our life now. And so she came, Sid, and from the minute that she was born, she started to enlighten me. Even at that time, when I was 27 to 33, all of that growth really did add to my creative process. It added to how I love on my family. It added to me accepting vulnerability as a strength because I had to be soft and gentle with her. It changed the way that I approach music. It changed the way that I approach life. And that's what was going on at the time when Prana was brought into this world, to answer your question. Wow, what a great story. They can really do that, you know. You think you're teaching them, and next thing you know, they're teaching you. 100%. Every day. And that's the thing that I love. We're only trying to give them the instruction and tell them stuff because we want them to not suffer, right? That's what I'm hoping that most people think. But the reality is... We also have to consider the young people's perspective. You have to consider it. And if you're paying attention to them from early and you're paying attention to their development style, their learning style, how they receive information, how they apply education, how they apply it in their life. If you're paying attention to that, then there should be no problem with you listening to what they have to say. And that's something that I learned from Prana in the preteen, teen, young adult years. I have to listen to her and pay attention without judgment, without trying to make her see it a different way. Just listen to what she has to say. What's the harm in that? But I learned that again from early on, and it was from the tutorial I got from my mother, from Yaya, that helped me to understand how I should operate with this being. Yeah. So Prana, I mean, you're pretty much born into this music business. I mean, you're in the studio at six months old, and your father is Riza, who's the founder of Wu-Tang Clan, a hip-hop legend. When does the music thing for you really start? When do you become aware that this is a real interest of yours and it's a passion of yours and the talent that you have? Yeah, I think the awareness of it probably is around maybe six years old. I think mom has videos of me singing as young as two with her band. But to me, it was probably the same way that a kid tries to learn how to talk by mimicking their parents. My mom sings, and so therefore, I sing, you know? But I don't think it was until I was six years old that it really clicked because I would ask mom, how do I get inside of there talking about the TV whenever we would watch programs? Mom put me in a drum class when I was a kid too, and I used to write one woman plays when I was six (laughs) years old. And my poor family, I love how much they indulge me, but they would sit through them and record them for me. Mm -hmm. And so I literally have on tape my little one woman plays and I would like come down the stairs and costume changes. And it was always very Cinderella-esque. I was always some orphan child with a stepmother and I was slaving away in the kitchen and all these things, (laughs) the drama of it all. And so 
for me, I think six was when it started. And then it just has always been an outlet for me. I've had a little journal songwriting book since I was about that same age. My mom gave me a guitar one year as a present, a cute pink guitar. And I didn't stick with guitar, but I moved on to violin. And then I was in choir for a bit at my school. I was in chamber. I think music has been one of those things that was always there. It wasn't that special that I was interested in doing it because my dad did it. My mom did it. Even me and my siblings, we have songs when we're kids that we recorded in our dad's studio. And we would call ourselves the Diggs clan, something like that. <laughs> but like dad would help us run sessions so we could record songs and he'd like teach you have one of us be in the producer chair so we could learn how to use logic and pro tools and things of that nature. So to me, this is what everyone's doing at their house. There's nothing right. special about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been there for me. Well, I was going to ask, obviously you've learned so much from your mom. What about your dad? What are some things that you learned from him mm -hmm. as an artist and a performer? Yeah, a big thing I've learned from my dad is the 10,000 hours, you know, where you have to put in your 10,000 hours to be a master at something. And then after that, don't stop either. And so my dad's big thing, whenever we're on the phone, even if we're just chit chatting, it's like a chill conversation. It always somehow turns to, so have you been practicing guitar? Have you written any new songs lately? Cause he's always like, it's just like a muscle. You constantly work at it. You constantly make sure it stays sharpened. And my dad doesn't go anywhere without his beat machine with him. I can't imagine him ever not creating music. Even whenever he's really focused on film, he's still always making music because that's something that he wants to keep sharp. And this is something that both of my parents really instilled in me, but like the importance of your creative intellectual property and just knowing that, yeah, the label is important and the people that know how to market and the people with the business mindset are important, but this ecosystem also doesn't work without your ideas. I think a lot of times young artists who are coming into the scene and don't have anyone to tell them what to look out for think like, oh, well, they have all the money and they have all the connections. And so they're the important aspect of this relationship. But really, you can't have one without the other. And they certainly won't have anything to market if you don't have your ideas. And so I'm happy that that was something that my parents taught me even before I had any interest in being involved in music. My ideas are valuable. And be careful who you tell your ideas to. That's right. Yeah. After the break, I'll talk more with One the Duo about their move to Nashville, their new album, and the inclusion of Black voices in the Nashville country scene. Welcome back to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, and today I'm talking with Takitha Washington and Prana Supreme Diggs, the mother-daughter act known as One the Duo. Well, listen, I want to ask y'all about moving to Nashville. You've been in Nashville for a while. How did that happen exactly, and what did that first year look like? My first time ever coming to Nashville was in 2015 with mom and we came out here just to like see what the music scene was like. And we knew one producer out here at the time, his name's Bar Nunn, and he connected us with Rebecca Lynn Howard and Alicia Hoffman. And they were such incredible people and really honestly set the tone for us for like, oh, this is what Nashville and its community has to offer. And we wrote a song with them. It was our very first co-write. And after that, we were like, you know what? maybe we'll give Nashville a shot to pursue this project because we really wanted to be able to explore our music without any preconceived notions of who we are, what we should have been doing. And mm -hmm. and I don't use the word shadow in a negative sense at all. So just wanting to like be able to explore things outside of the shadow of Wu-Tang Clan or my dad and just have that be like its own separate thing. Because a lot of people here... They know of my dad and they know of Wu-Tang, but most of them never heard a song. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> this is where I need to be. Yeah. And so we came out here permanently in 2016. That's when we like actually did the move. And that first year was very interesting, actually. We were only here for four months because in the later half of the year, we would end up going on tour with a musical. And that lasted for seven months. And so... 
I knew the inside of the Sprinter van better than I knew the inside of our place at that point. <laughs> but yeah, our first year was really just like getting to know the city. It was changing so much already when we got here in 2016. Yeah. And I think the main thing that stuck out for us about Nashville was just how welcoming everyone was. And mom had to get used to that. She would go to the grocery store and be like, why is everyone talking to me? It was a problem. <laughs> Not even necessarily coming from L.A. because mom has spent so much time in New York. Really, it was more your New York sensibilities of just like... Leave I, me alone. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the store. I'm doing my thing. And if you're talking to me, you're trying to get something from me. So why are you talking to me? <laughs> wait, and, hold on. Wait, wait. Let me just interject for two seconds. Because Sid, hold on. Let me tell the real story, okay? What had happened was I was at the Whole Foods one day. Prana was there. And we were in the line. And this woman, she was really talking to me. And I was trying to one word, like, dead end the conversation. But she wasn't giving it up. And then finally, I say to myself, Takitha, turn around and look at this woman. Talk to her. So now I turn. I gave her my attention. Holy crap. She was the most lovely lady. I ended up helping this woman after she had knee surgery. Like, we ended up becoming friends. It was the craziest thing. Because, Lord Jesus, the checkout people in Nashville, Tennessee, they are moving slow. So I learned a lot about my new friends in that aisle, okay? We come out the door and I'm looking at Prana, I'm all happy. And then he just hit me. I said, hold on, Prana. I said, oh my God, it's me. <laughs> and she said, yes, mom, yes. It like rung my bell to where I was like, oh my God, I'm not acclimating to the environment. And you might have some people that are just God bless you, and they don't really mean it. But more often than not, in the Nashville community, they have done nothing but wrap their arms around Prana and I and love us authentically the way that we love them authentically, yeah. too. This is home base is, for us. That's a beautiful thing. But, you know, you got to build in some extra time for those grocery store runs. I mean, do. you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. There definitely is such a profound love that I have for the people in Nashville. Like I say this all the time. The community is really what makes Nashville home for me. And I think the friendships I have made here are family. Mm. It is not just like, oh, yeah, these are the people I go out with. Like, these people are my left arm and my right leg. And I really don't know how to function without them. And it is so genuine. It is without want and is without That's expectation. Right. I'm very serious about connection and something very unique to Nashville that I haven't experienced in New York or Chicago or LA was this open armness that really didn't have a limit. It reminds me of the black community. I got to be honest. It reminds me mm -hmm. of that the energy. And those are the kind of friends that I've made over my lifetime, but I wasn't expecting it here. I just was, I didn't know what to expect, you know? The fact that the project was born and bred out of here, which was intentional, but I never could have imagined that it would be this kind of wealth in humanity. Mm. We're not even talking about music now or making music or finding the best partners in our company. And it's not even about that. It has to start with the human beings first. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it really feels like home, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So y'all get to Nashville in 2016. I've got to ask about how the duo came together. Prana, I heard you say on the Today Show that it was your idea to partner with your mom. Was this kind of a year-long pitch or <laughs> did it really sort of boil down to one conversation? Honestly, in a way, it was a year-long pitch in the terms of like, I pitched it and then she said no. And then I threw a temper tantrum. And then after the temper tantrum, she was like, okay, Let's hear what you have to say. And then I explained to mom the same thing I was saying, how my parents have taught me so much about the industry that I knew that I would be so protected if she was right beside me doing this. And my mom would not need to live vicariously through her child because this is the job that she does and has been doing my whole life. And then also, my mom is my best friend. And I've been calling her that since I was 10 years old. And I don't feel like anyone knows her better than I know her. And I don't feel like anyone knows me better than she knows me. For those reasons alone, she was like, all right, I'll hear you out. But you need to prove that you can do this, this, and this. We picked a song. We still sing the cover in our shows now, but it's called Put the Gun Down by ZZ Ward. And we used to rehearse that song as if it was ours so that I would have a song to practice with. And 
get used to constructive criticism. But I think that's the part of working with a parent where you have to make sure you have great communication skills because as a child, if your parents telling you you're doing something wrong, at least for me, it felt like the end of the world. And so I had to get used to the fact that her saying, hey, try this instead, was not an indictment of my character or my work ethic, but just like, hey, this is going to help make you better, which is ultimately what both of us want. And so 2015 to 2018, that yes. whole period of my life was just to Develop. prepare me to really do this in a serious way. And so going on that tour was a part of it. Meeting producers and doing co-writes was a part of it. Understanding how to read a contract was a part of it. And then also at the same time, I was working at a Montessori and I was doing creative direction at my dad's clothing line. So I was doing a whole bunch of things. And I think mom wanted me to do stuff like that too. So I could also just have more real world experience and then also experience with leading other people. Because when I was working at my dad's company, I was the right hand man to the person who was in charge, not my father, another man. So it was a four year pitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and let's be clear. I think you just turned 23. Is that right? Correct. So you've done a lot <laughs> <laughs> in a short period of time. Thank you. So y'all have an album coming out called Blood Harmony. And I love the name, and especially for y'all, who came up with the name? I did. It was something that rang true to me before there was even an album to say we were doing. Right. We were just singing a cappella a lot together, and I was like, dude, our album has to be called Blood Harmony. It has to. I said, because... People who know music know how Blood Harmony is very different from a group of great vocalists singing together in comparison to people who are actually blood related. That harmony is different. It touches the soul different. And now that the album has come together, it even has deeper meaning. This embodies everything about who we are that's coming out through the sound of our voice. It is a gift from God. It really just sort of sums up your story and your sound and what y'all are all about. It's great. Yeah, it really does make the title of the album make sense. This is not just a handful of like cool ditties or we weren't trying to impress anyone. We were really just being authentically ourselves. And we had an amazing roster of people who helped foster the growth of that blood harmony, which I think is also true to who we are, is created with more blood, with more people. You know, you might hear some synth or hear an 808 in a few songs that Nash Overstreet may have produced, but the reality is everything you hear was recorded live with live musicians. Every single song. I needed to have the album be produced that way. It was something that I talked to Prana about before we ever even got to Nashville, one of the things that I needed to have happen was, it's not gonna be a programmed record. If you wanna work with me, this is what working with me looks like. And one of the prerequisites that I had besides her just getting exposure, getting more experience and keeping her GPA up and doing her extracurricular activities, I needed her to know that I don't do hobbies. If we're gonna do it, this is what it has to look like. And on top of that, it's got to be authentic, organic music. And without you, Sid, asking us these questions, who would really know that that's how much care and calculation went into the creation of this body of work? It's art, you know? Well, you can feel it and you hear it in the songs, the range of different sounds on the album. One of the songs that I believe y'all played that night that I saw you in Nashville was called Feels Good. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And when you listen to it, it does exactly that. It makes you feel good. Talk to me about that one. And I think you start the album with that song. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the opening track on the album, which we co-wrote with Shane Stevens and Nash Overstreet, who also produced it. I love that song so much. When the demo of the song was even done, we immediately started listening to it constantly. And once we had got the finished or semi-finished version of it, and mom and I are like notorious, loud listeners of music in the car. 
And we actually mm-hmm. have a rule in our car about talking. We're, we're like, no talking in the car because we want to hear our music. And so whenever we're rolling around town, windows are down, music is loud. And there was a period when we were listening to Feels Good a lot that when we would be like at a stop sign or at a stoplight, people would legitimately start dancing on the street listening to our song and one time we were in hillsborough village we were stuck there because it was like really trafficy so we were sitting there for even longer oh by the movie theater yeah and there was like a group of girls on the corner and they were dancing they were dancing and this girl literally runs up to our car and she's like i've been trying to shazam this song please tell me what song this is we're like it's ours it's not (laughs) even out yet she's like oh my god i love this song so much already i'm so happy that that's the feeling that everyone else got from the song because it's just such a special song down to the music video, you know? It has our whole family in it. Honestly, that video was really just a family reunion that we got <laughs> someone oh, to film. Yeah. yeah. I love the video and I love seeing all the family coming together. And it's it's like everybody's getting together for a big barbecue or something. Yeah. Yes, it was exactly that. Like literally my aunt and my yaya cooked the food. And my nephew King. Cooking. King got busy. We shot it back home in LA. And so we had our whole family come in from Sacramento and our family that lives in the greater LA area come and it just mixed with the song, which really is just about our California culture and not caring what the labels are of anything. We're just like, does it make you happy? Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. Well, that's as organic as it gets right there. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's the opener on the album. There's another great song on there called Stuck in the Middle. And mm. I love the song. And in some ways, it's very traditional mm-hmm. with the instruments. There's a kind of country sound to it but in other ways there's some hip-hop influence coming into the lyrics is that fair oh you you got it right on the money that's what we're going for it's the same with feels good and another (laughs) song on the album called hoedown lyrically we always make sure actually we don't have to make sure that's just naturally how we write (laughs) if anything being able to do co-writes allows more of the country soundscape to come into play because naturally mom is a mc mom is a poet mom is a rapper before she's a singer in my opinion just because Mm. of how she writes music Mm. and then same for myself i don't really consider myself a rapper but i do think the way i write is very influenced by that because of who my parents are and hip-hop is my most listened to genre hands down And so it has a huge, huge influence on how I make music. So it is purposeful for us to be like, I got the block lined up at the front door, like a sneaker drop, and they want more. That's hip hop. Like you're outside of the Supreme store. You're at Nike waiting for the Jordans, you know? The blending of those things are so important to us because we never wanted to compromise on our blackness because hip hop is a culture to us. It's not just a genre. It's really thoroughly something that we are a part of and we love country music but we knew that we still needed to be us especially because we didn't want anyone to feel like we were trying to pander to the country crowd right by letting go of what we came from because nothing worse than inauthenticity yeah Well, you're really doing it your way and you're really bringing something new into the country space and it's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, there aren't a ton of mother-daughter duos who have really made it in country music. I think of like the Judds, but not a lot of others come to mind. I mean, are y'all hoping to do this for the long run? Absolutely. Absolutely. I already can't wait for our reunion tour. Um, <laughs> what is the funniest part, too? This album isn't even released. We're trying to get the tour launched. We're doing a lot of stuff right now. And we're going to start talking about 
girl, so listen, next album, this yeah. is what we got to do. Here's what I love, though, too. Prana and I have independent interests, independent likes, but one, the duo is the anchor. We're going to utilize this magic because it's magical, this thing that we do together. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep coming back to it. But the music has to be supreme. It has to be special. It has to impact lives. It has to warm the hearts. It has to heal. And I think even if we're not doing one, the duo, even when we're taking the time to work on whatever our solo stuff is, the fact of the matter is we're collaborative partners always. Yes. Like, this is the person that I'm bouncing ideas off of the most. This is the Same. person that hears all my unfinished songs. Same. And so even if it's not got the one, the duo name at the bottom of it, it is one, the duo. Yeah. yeah. This is the lifelong journey that we're on. And how fortunate are we that we have the intellect we have the blessing from the most high. That's the first and foremost, because he's the only one charging the step to begin with, that we have the awareness to know that we're able to do those things. So we can bounce and shift and move and be independent, be together, but it will be for the greater good. It will be yeah. for the greater good. Because if it's not going to impact the community, I don't want no parts of it. And that's what I told Prana back then. And that's what she understands about me. It's about intention and about the heart and about humanity. That's what this really is about. We're just wrapping it in music, Sid. You know, you talk about impacting the community. I've just got one more question for y'all. You know, historically, there have not been a lot of Black artists in country music, but that is changing and seems to be changing in a pretty profound way. What does it mean to you to be a Black artist in country music in 2023? Prana, I'll start with you. I'll go back to what I said earlier, but the not compromising part, I think, is really important. I think often for Black artists, if they're coming to a space where they don't feel like they're going to be welcomed as who they are completely, they try to shed or mask some of that. And I think being a Black artist in 2023 means that you don't have to do that anymore. And whoever is going to love you and your personality and your music is going to love you, you know, and you don't have to try to claw for every single person because some people are just not going to get it. And new things are inherently scary, but I don't think we should be fearful of new. We shouldn't be scared to have more queer country artists, more Latino country artists. It should just be the melting pot that we know America to be. And country is, alongside hip hop, one of the most American genres. So it really should reflect what America looks like, you know, for such a rich tapestry. And I feel like it's weird to be like, mm, no, I don't want to hear your story, though. I'm so fascinated by other people. It's hard for me to put myself in that mindset. So being a black artist for me right now just means not compromising and not putting on a show either. So I think that's the other side of the coin from the trying to shed part of yourself is putting on too much. So that they're like, oh, I'm the only black person in the room, so I'm going to ham it up. And it's like, no, don't do that either. Just mm. be you. Just be you. Yeah. To Keitha, what about you? For me, because I kind of straddled the fence between executive and artist, what I'm seeing in the country landscape are more women and men of color in senior executive positions for the business, for the system that is running the business of music, in our case, country music. So I've been able to get mentorship from the likes of Shannon Sanders and Gina Miller, who are here in Nashville, who are senior executives in the system and this business. Without them, we wouldn't have the advocacy for Black creatives in the country space because they are so tried and true. They've been in the business for 30 years not just on a senior executive level, but especially where Shannon is concerned as a Grammy nominated, Dove Award winning, all of the things that he does in his life and the accolades that he has, mm -hmm. that actually opens the door for at least a person who's in the room who can speak the language that Prana and I are speaking. So for me, both parts are incredibly important because it's hard to have advocacy when people don't know what they don't know. They think because of the, how their heart feels that they've got it figured out. They're liberal, you know, is a word I hear a lot around here. They're open and they have black friends, but they still are not understanding. They still do not have a true understanding. 
And so it takes more people of color, like Prana was saying, whether it's Latino or Asian or Black or the LGBTQ, that should be represented for the people who are coming through those doors that need advocacy for the thing that they actually identify with. Everybody should have that freedom or that connection or that outlet or a plug to charge into. What I've been seeing in this town has made me very happy in the last seven years we've been here. I can see the tick up. And I really want to give a shout out to CMA and CMT specifically because of how they advocate. It is not lip service. It comes through in action. I've never experienced anything quite like this. So that's how I know that the advocacy is authentic and it's true and they mean it because they're backing it up through their hiring. A couple of other labels in town that I won't mention because I don't want to mess it up, but they're doing the same thing. They're advocating. I can tell by how they're hiring. Natural stepping up. That's not to say other things are, you know, get a little wacky. But if you were to ask me, overall, we're working to move this thing in the right direction to create more exposure for all. These stories are important to what Prana said. If we're missing the Latina girls' country songs because we just don't want her in, you're missing a whole opportunity for comfort and growth and wisdom and connection because i feel like that's the thing when you don't have pathways to other people's stories you think that you have their story figured out and that well there can't possibly be anything in common about us but then Not we're true. way more similar as a human race than we are dissimilar that's right you know and that's so right. and music is the universal connector so yeah it is i felt country music had a responsibility too because it is such a storytelling genre just imagine if we could allow these stories to be told and to promise point, create more unification through this tapestry, through the through all of the different shades and tones and ethnicities and nationalities. And uh, just imagine if you don't cut it off, that you let the love reciprocate, like figure eight, you know, it just seems like if any true country purist who really believes that the song is so important, which it is, and that the stories are important, expand your mind of what pure is then. Let that be inclusive, because your world will change because of it. Yeah. Well, y'all have a great story, and I feel like you are on a rocket ship that is about to take off. It was so great talking to you, to Keitha and Prana, won the duo. Thanks for being on Biscuits and Jam. Yay, Thanks for having so us. Happy to be here. We got to get food next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Takitha Washington and Prana Supreme Diggs of One the Duo. Southern Living is based in Birmingham, Alabama. Be sure to follow Biscuits and Jam on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And we'd love your feedback. If you could rate this podcast and leave us a review, we'd really appreciate it. You can also find us online at southernliving.com slash biscuits and jam. Our theme song is by Sean Watkins of Nickel Creek. I hope you'll join us next week for my conversation with the Texas author, speaker, and podcast host, Jen Hatmaker. We'll see you then.